Welcome to the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and Key Time Enforcement Institute, sponsored by the ABA Criminal Justice Center. This session is entitled Procurement Fraud. Before I introduce our panel, I would like to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Cone, Cone, and Calipino LP is the supporting sponsor for the 2020 Virtual Civil False Claims Act and Key Time Enforcement Institute. Thank you for your support. Moderating this session is Michael Walsh. Michael is a partner at Robbins, Russell, Engler, Forsyth, Unterreiner, and Sauber. Michael, you may proceed with the program. Thank you, Courtney. Welcome to the first and hopefully last Zoom version of the <laughs> False Claims Act's procurement fraud panel. I'm thrilled today to be joined by some of the most experienced and accomplished uh, False Claims Act practitioners. Um, the ones on this panel are Jonathan Arney, and let me just briefly introduce Jonathan. He is a partner at the law firm of Shepard Mullen. He has represented and counseled numerous large and small government contractors in False Claims Act and other matters. He's authored dozens of articles and co-authored the leading treatise on the GSA Multiple Award Schedule Program, which we'll be discussing later. And if you really want to have something interesting to discuss, uh, Jonathan is the court-appointed federal monitor over the New Orleans Police Department. So he knows a lot about policing and the use of force and uh, would uh, love to talk to you about it after this session, I'm sure. Um, Alicia Bentley is a senior trial counsel at the Department of Justice. She has been litigating False Claims Act cases for the government for more than 20 years. She handles primarily cases involving defective products, including ballistic vest, vests, uh, helicopter gears, and other military hardware. Um, although Alicia also recently mentioned that she's all of a sudden started to learn a lot about vaccines, which uh, is a slightly different area, um, but uh, shows that, that uh, she's keeping up with current events. Um, Vince McKnight is the Washington, Washington DC managing partner of Sanford, Heisler and Sharp and is the co-chair of the firm's whistleblower practice. Uh, along with handling employment discrimination and wrongful discharge cases, uh, Vince has represented whistleblowers in sealed and unsealed False Claims Act key TAM suits around the country and has won victories and settlements in uh, many of them. Uh, like the other panelists, many of Vincent's cases have been uh, federal procurement fraud cases. Um, let me start by taking a few minutes at the outset to provide a little background about our topic uh, for today's panel, the federal, uh, federal procurement fraud. And, and let me just start with a little personal history. Um, I started practicing law in the late 1980s, um, and at a time when the 1986 amendments to the False Claims Act were a relatively new thing. Uh, the False Claims Act, while having been around since 1863, had long sort of gone dormant and uh, sort of was in disuse until the 1986 amendments. Um, and it's worth noting that the original False Claims Act, the 1863 version, um, was, uh, arose because of federal procurement fraud. Um, it was the moldy blankets and the guns that didn't work during the Civil War that led to the passage of the act. Um, and the inspiration, similarly, the inspiration for the 1986 amendments was the Reagan defense buildup in the 1980s. Um, along with a major increase in federal defense funding, there came stories about uh, the $600 toilet seats and the $435 hammers. Um, and as a response to that, uh, to address the issues about fraud and abuse in the defense procurement system uh, that led to the revising of the uh, False Claims Act in 90, 1986, which um, turned it into the tool it is today for fighting uh, procurement fraud. Um, today, the vast majority of FCA recoveries 
and tend to involve healthcare and healthcare related issues. But I just want to note that the procurement related cases remain a significant uh, portion of what the Justice Department is able to recover every year for the United States. And I looked it up uh, before the session and in 2019, according to the Justice Department's uh, annual statistics, uh, the defense industry alone accounted for more than 250 million in False Claims Act recoveries. So what we're hoping to do today with this panel is to discuss some of the leading types of cases that one typically sees in the federal procurement area, discuss what the common fact patterns are that you see in these cases, how Relators Council and uh, the government go about investigating and developing these federal procurement fraud cases, and how defense counsel approach uh, defending these cases, and what are the common uh, legal defenses and factual defenses that uh, uh, government contractors use when faced with uh, False Claims Act cases. Um, we'll also spend a little time at the end discussing uh, what types of subject matters and areas uh, we see in the future, what types of cases we expect to become uh, more common in, in the next few years. Um, so uh, before we um, sort of jump, before we jump into the topic, I, I do want to take a, just a, a moment for a really a personal note. Um, when I started in the late 1980s and when Jonathan Arany uh, also started, we were both at the law firm of Freed Frank uh, as brand new associates. Um, and the young partner who was starting to focus on this was then basically a new area of the law, um, the Revitalized False Claims Act, was Jack Basie. And I, I know I speak for Jonathan that he was a wonderful teacher, a wonderful mentor, and a wonderful role model. Um, he was one of the founders of this conference, the National Institute uh, for the False Claims Act uh, and KETAM, and uh, he was a fixture at it, a speaker at it uh, for, uh, you know, since, since the beginning. Um, I, I won't repeat what others have said over the last few days of this conference about uh, what a, a wonderful man Jack was, but I would urge you to listen, if you have a chance, to the remembrances of Doug Baruch yesterday uh, who really, I thought, captured Jack's uh, a very vibrant and large personality. Um, I, I'll just say that Jack will be missed by his many friends, and that's really just anyone who has ever come across and met Jack, because er, er, you couldn't know him for more than 30 seconds without uh, becoming a friend. Uh, we'll all miss his uh, loud and infectious laugh, his amazing enthusiasm, his uh, great and good cheer, and also the insights and the encyclopedic knowledge of the False Claims Act, uh, where he was the, the, the expert, uh, at least for many of us. Um, I think this uh, conference and, and many of our lives uh, will not be the same and will be considerably poorer without him. Uh, and. Uh, He's at least he's, he's in our thoughts, I know. Um, let, let me turn back to the, the, the uh, question at hand, the Procurement Fraud uh, 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 False Claims Act uh, panel. And you'll see in your conference um, materials that we have a PowerPoint slides and they're, they're loaded up today also. Um, but we are going to use these PowerPoint slides really just as more of a resource for you. You can go back to them. They're in your course materials. You can go back to them, and they're, you know, wonderful uh, nighttime reading, bedtime reading for everybody. Um, we may refer to them occasionally, uh, but mainly just to, uh, you know, frame the discussion. Uh, we're not going to be marching through them one by one. Hopefully, it'll be a more uh, free-flowing discussion, and that'll be... Uh, we hope more interesting for everybody. Um, so uh, 
after saying I'm not going to march through the slides, we'll just move a couple slide, uh, go through a couple slides. Um, uh, next slide, please. Um, uh, we're not. Uh, we have in our materials the elements of the False Claims Act. We assume everybody knows that. Um, but it's here for you if, if you need it. Next slide. Um, we also put in the principal substantive defenses, materiality, um, uh, which you know af after Escobar is now uh, you know pretty prominent in every case. Um, ambiguity, uh, which is something that uh, especially in the procurement area is, is a, always a major defense and lack of wrongful intent. And we, uh, I, I think we'll be coming back to them uh, during the course of our discussion today, but we wanted to at least at the, at the beginning uh, have them out there uh, and, and in your course materials. Uh, next slide, please. Um, the three areas that uh, we thought um, uh, when the panelists talked about it seemed to be the ones which uh, had the uh, most current interests that seem to be most prevalent uh, in the federal procurement area had to do with GSA multiple award schedule contracting, uh, Department of Defense contracting, and Department of Energy contracting. Uh, so today we will uh, discuss uh, those three types of, uh, of False Claims Act cases, three areas where False Claims Act cases commonly arise. Um, and then, as I say, at the end, we hope to discuss a little bit maybe what the new developing areas uh, will be. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, government multiple award schedule contracting, next slide. Um, Let's start, uh, Vince, with you. Um, could you just talk briefly about what the primary types of GSA schedule cases, uh, what they are, and what are the, the common fact, fact patterns for those types of cases? Sure. I'll be happy to do that. Can everybody hear me? Um, the, uh, the first two things you see on the slide here are the price reduction clause and the commercial sales practices format. And... And, and in many respects, they go hand in hand. Uh, at the formation of a, a GSA contract, uh, contractors must uh, upload all their prices that they are going to have for the various products into the uh, system. And that during the formation uh, um, during the formation process, also they have to identify their best customers or the group of their best customers, and then the contracting officer looks at the prices set by their um, best customers and uh, negotiates a price for the government. And um, what's interesting about that, let's say if the, your best customer gets uh, uh, the group gets maybe a fifteen percent reduction or um, discount, then the government may want to say a 20% um, reduction through the life of the contract on a group of uh, products. And once that relationship has been established, then that relationship cannot be disturbed. So therefore, if you go out the day after you sign your GSA contract and start giving private commercial people much better deals, you have disturbed the relationship. And so you've created a problem for yourself and you're now cheating the government. What you're supposed to do is go back to the government and say, hey, I, you know, General Motors just called me and they want uh, a 25% discount. It's a one-off deal and it's not going to happen again and negotiate for them what their price should be should be from that point forward. Um, and so it's it's price. It's where the rubber hits the road. And one of the things I want to tell you about, just to give you a practice pointer from, what, from where I sit anyway in this regard, is that I think it's very difficult to have a major footprint in the commercial area, in the government area at the same time if you're a huge vendor. And one of the difficulties is as many companies have uh, separate public and private 
contracting departments, and sometimes they don't talk to each other. And so especially if you're in the world of IT or you're selling software or things like that, it's a little bit of the wild, wild west. And if a big company comes in and says, I'm not going to buy this unless you give me a 30% discount, and one of your competitors is saying, I'm going to give them um, 28 then you'll see that those deals are, are sometimes formed. But the, uh, the commercial contracting office doesn't tell the government contracting officers and now Houston we have a, we have a problem and that, that's one of the ways that this um, actually uh, comes into being it's the competitiveness of the commercial marketplace and so prices and everything's happening at the speed of light and at the same time you need to get back to the government and fix your prices um, the, the next area is the trade agreements act or by mm-hmm. America. Hmm? Okay, can I can I just interject one thing before you go to the sure country? sure it, you know, it, it's going to be interesting because GSA is slowly but surely uh, realizing they don't need the price reductions clause or the commercial sales practice format. So those things are being phased out. And, and I, I, you know, I, I'm always wondering, you know, if the government now recognizes it doesn't need it, what that says about materiality in the first place. Oh, I, I, go oh, ahead. No, 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 go. I, 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 I understand. And I, I, I think that that's important. I do think that um, you're either going to have to – meaning this was a mechanism for for uh, creating a presumption of a reasonable price, okay? And so that was one way it was being done. So if you don't do it this way, you're going to have to do it the other way, which is uh, actually bring in the prices, have a discussion about your prices, and then establish some baseline reasonableness. I don't care how you get there. You're still going to have to establish that and have some truth in negotiation, if you will, and exposing and explaining what your pricing structure is so that the government can know that it got a fair deal um, in the process. So there are different ways to do it, I, I agree, but I don't see how you can have government contracting without going through um, the, what I think is a very material issue, what's the price going to be, and are we getting a good, fair bargain here. Um, but the, I agree with you that there are lots of different ways to, to skin that cat. Um, on the uh, Trade Agreements Act uh, area, that's an issue where the government that puts clauses in many of its contracts, not just GSA, um, that require the contract to conform to the Trade Agreements Clause, which says that we're not going to buy any products that didn't originate in a country that we have a trade agreement with. So an easy way to think about it is we don't have a trade agreement with, with, with China. And so technically speaking, we're not supposed to be buying um, Chinese products under a lot of the GSA schedules unless certain exceptions uh, apply to the, to the uh, particular contract at play. Um, and, you know, there are a host of issues associated with the uh, TAA. Uh, and they're, they're too complicated. It would take 45 minutes an hour just to get stuck there. I can say one thing that for the most part, I think as a practical matter, the government buys Chinese products. You know, Alicia, you can correct me or not, but <laughs> Chinese products. I can't products, answer that question. <laughs> she's not allowed to answer that. I'm I want to hear answer that question. All right. You don't have to answer it. Chinese products are making their way into the United States government. Okay. Millions of dollars are being spent on Chinese products every year from my own observation. And I think oftentimes contracting officers are aware of the fact that Chinese products are coming into the government. And my view is that contracting officers have programmatic needs. They need to take care of their people. And so if, uh, you know, if, if there's a war going on in the Middle East and we need um, a, a whole stack of uh, laptops that will withstand certain, you know, uh, you know, bumps and bruises in, a, in, in an RV or something like that. Then we're going to get them, and, and and we need them now. And and whoever's clamoring for the equipment doesn't care where they came from for the most part. And so the the uh, contracting officer is just trying to keep his people happy and keep the show on the road. And I think that affects things. So I I found that as I was filing these cases, we were starting to discover that the contracting officer was more than aware of the fact that uh, he was getting Chinese products. And another way he knew is because there's something called drop shipping. (laughs) Drop shipping is where (laughs) they order the product and it actually comes from the manufacturer in a big box. 
and the box has Chinese writing all over it. So it got hard to say <laughs> that the contracting officer didn't know that he was buying Chinese products. So poor Alicia goes, uh, I filed a case and she goes to the contracting officer and says, did you know about it? And he goes, well, I did notice those characters on the box, but you know, they do make a good widget. And so then at that point in time, we have a materiality issue. And I, I think that uh, for that reason, trade agreement act cases are difficult to uh, pursue right now, at least under the current standards of, of materiality. Um, there used to be issues of knowledge because the um, our intent associated with this because of the fact that, you know, sometimes the supply chains are murky. But now I don't think supply chains are murky anymore. People know where they're getting stuff from because they have these wonderful um, you know, on computer tracking services, they can tell you where every single widget came from and the date that it was manufactured there. You know, if you dig into enterprise management resource systems, you know where stuff came from. And also, uh, many of the IT manufacturers and other manufacturers have moved to Mexico, Vietnam, and India, where they we have trade agreements, so we, they can make compliant products. So I don't see it as big an issue right now. It might become a bigger issue you know, in, in the coming year, though, especially, you know, depending on what our relationship with China is. And uh, also, it might become a bigger issue if Grassley's uh, amendments about materiality, um, which are pending and probably up for discussion in the first quarter of next year, go through. That'll change the game, and that might become more of an issue once again. You know, uh, it is, it is, it is, I, I agree with you, Vincent, that, that I think we're going to see fewer of those. It is interesting, though, to, to look back because the TAA created this almost cottage industry of what I call serial relators, right? These, these guys who would look at, who would find a computer that they thought was made in China and then sue 30 GSA contractors at the same time. And you had, I mean, I think, I think it went from 2005, there was one of those, and then 2006, and then 2007, and then 2008. And I mean, most of those, most of those cases were dismissed, but it did create this whole industry of people who had no real connection with the company going to their local courthouse, looking at the back of a computer, seeing it said China, and then suing 30 companies. It, it was really a phenomenon in Commercial Items False Claims Act time, in, in my experience. Well, that case that you're actually referring to, that Crennan matter, and that's the exact fa facts from the Crennan case. And... Um, there was a uh, there was a lawyer and he went to a courthouse I think in Colorado and he saw that the products there were uh, Chinese right. and he went from there you know but you also have to think at the same time there were um, there's a whole group of contractors they're called value added resellers and they uh, they sell the same products to the United States government they configure computer layout so if justice department wants computers they also need switches and they also need all kinds of printers and they need to configure an entire floor full of equipment well a, a value added reseller will come in and put the whole deal together for them and so these these people know everybody's supply chain because they're sharing a supply chain so some of the people who are coming forward were actually um, salesmen or women in this supply chain, so they knew if they saw the green widget and they knew knew where it was coming from, and they couldn't sell it, they were actually at a disadvantage if someone else over there is selling the same green widget and saying, "Hey, it's made in America," and they're sitting there going, "Well, no, it's not." So it created a conflict in that situation um, too. And I can see uh, their margins were so slim. Uh, the VARs have like a 4% profit margin at the end. So any one of these shifts like that became very, very important to them. I had, uh, it even gets more detailed than that. I had a series of cases, the office supply store cases um, a long time ago, Staples, you know, and the rest of those cases. And they were actually sourcing office supplies from the same manufacturer. And the manufacturer was just putting a different name on the box. So one would say Staples, one would say Office Depot, and then they would have, uh, the number would be the same, and then a letter would be the, different at the end. But they were the exact same products. And so some people were selling them and some people weren't. And so the people were saying, hey, how come I'm getting in trouble for this and I'm not? So there was this battle going on, you know, within within the, uh, the, the industry, the salespeople. But again, the biggest problem is, 
this stuff was going into the government, and I think 50, hundreds of millions of dollars worth of stuff is in the government right now. So you're either going to enforce it or you're not. And right now, there's a serious materiality issue, and I haven't had one of these cases for – my last case was that uh, – uh, Fang B 40 net matter, which was famous for other matters because that was the one where the uh, former U.S. attorney um, sold the complaint to uh, or tried to sell the complaint to the defendant. And I got a phone call from the uh, U.S. attorney that that um, um, I think the seal's about to be breached because somebody tried to sell your complaint. And that had a whole life of its own. Um, and, and again, we could talk about that for a long time, too. But the uh, I don't think it's really a significant issue right now, and we have to kind of put it on a back burner and see what happens uh, in the coming year. Um, defective, de defective products, just what it sounds like. You know, um, there are certain specifications or requirements for a particular product. The government needs it. It's important. Those specifications mean something. And instead of meeting the specifications, you say, I, cert I say or certify that they've met, met certain certifications or they've met certain specifications, and then I sell you something else. Um, so that that's pretty easy, um, an easy one, and I think that'll always, you know, be around. I think your primary GSA cases right now are price reduction clause violations and also defective products. You're going to get your most bang for your buck in in, in those areas, in, in in my opinion. Let me ask uh, Alicia then, uh, from the government standpoint. Um, one of these cases, you know, shows up at your door from Vince. Uh, how do you go about investigating them? Um, the first thing, obviously, you interview the relator and go through the documents and see what they have. Um, and then from that, one of the issues with GSA contracts is the primary purchaser is almost never the GSA itself. And so you need to track down who actually bought the products, whether the product worked, what were their understandings when they um, when they bought the product? And that's from the defective product side. Um, on the price reductions and the trade agreement and the commercial practices issues, those you're dealing with the GSA contracting officer. Um, and you want to talk to those people post Escobar. You want to talk to them sooner rather than later, um, because even if you can show fraud on the part of the conduct of the defendant. You need to know that the people in the government are not going to say, yeah, we knew it and we didn't think it was a big deal. Um, because post Escobar, that's a, a huge problem. Um, so that has, that has changed things quite a bit in our scheduling of how we uh, investigate things. Um, I tend to usually do a pretty early subpoena. Um, my younger colleagues do CIDs. I've not really been a fan. Um, because I remember when Janet Reno had to sign them herself and right. it took 16 months to get one. So um, I just find there's nothing like nothing to focus the attention like an IG subpoena served by a nice federal agent. <laughs> um, Jonathan, the, the IG subpoena is sent to your client. Uh, how do you approach defending one of these GSA schedule cases? <laughs> well, the, the first thing you do is you realize that the subpoena has no bearing on reality at all, that the IG is asking, the IG is asking for for a thousand times what the government actually needs to figure out its case. So the first thing you do <laughs> is you is you call the IG and you say, "Let's be real here." And ninety nine percent of the time, the IG works with you to come up with a reasonable subpoena in a reasonable time frame. Uh, but I do, I, I do, I do love the concept that I'm sure Alicia doesn't have this, but many in the government have that. That industry can just press a button and all of a sudden all these documents appear in a nice pile. Uh, we cannot do that any more than the government can do that. Uh, so I mean, if you could produce them in a nice pile, that would be a big change, but you never do. <laughs> no, I get them and they come in and they're like in garbage bags. Well, sure, if the, government, if the government could ask for what it actually needed, then we'd produce it in a pile. I view the, I mean, once the subpoena is served, it's like an invitation to a party. And then you get the invitation and you decide, do I want to go to the party? Or do I, what time do I want to come to the party? What do I want to bring to the party? That's the big question. Well, let's ask, let's ask Jonathan that question. Um, uh, you're being invited to the party. How do you approach that invitation? Do you want to cooperate? Do you not want to cooperate? What, what's your 
advice to your clients? What is, tends to be your advice to your clients about that? Right. Well, first, we always cooperate. And, 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 and frankly, we, we, we in, in industry want to figure it out just as much as the government does. Uh, I, I, know, I know that's often not believed, but, but we, like the moment we have a hint of anything wrong, we, we spend a fortune on a thorough internal investigation. Uh, Michael, you and I have done those together for years, so you, 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 you know what I'm saying. So, so we very much want to figure out what the truth is. If we, if we figure out that there was a problem, then then we just say it and we pay back the money. The, 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 the issue usually comes up in my experience is that, and I'll, I'll, I'll brace myself for a leash to yell back at me here, but in that the government comes in and the government's view is usually, you know, let's just not worry about liability. Let's just talk about how much money you're going to pay us. And, and whereas, whereas I want to focus on Liability. I want to focus on whether there was actually a fraud. So I want to get into the government contracts issues. You know, the things Vincent talked about, the price reduction clause, the commercial sales practice format, those are very complicated statutes with a thousand different exceptions to them. I, I want to figure out that to see if there really was a fraud before I start thinking about whether we owe any money. So the investigation, Michael, is what's most important to me right up front. And... Um I'll ask both Vince and uh, and Jonathan. What's the um, what's the end game here? What's the how do these cases tend to get resolved? Well, in my in my experience, they typically get resolved by us beating the government into submission with a check. <laughs> <laughs> Can I go back to something you said earlier? Yeah, I think I've had a lot of experience where. The defendants have come in, and most of my stuff is defective products. And sometimes they come in and they say, well, you know, we tested these and maybe. And, you know, when somebody comes in honestly in the beginning and says, yeah, we did whatever to it and it just doesn't seem to be working. And we know you have some bad documents because you showed them to us in that first presentation. Let's talk about how to deal with this. And those actually go great. Um, I'm not, you know. I'm, I've been at the department 23 years. I don't need another big settlement to make me feel good about myself. You know, I sit down and say, okay, well, here's what we need to do. And in certain circumstances, we have, you know, structured things so that the product would get repaired. Because sometimes it's more important that we have that widget in a functional area than spending tons and tons of money on litigation. Um, for me, the problems are, when you come in and you want to talk about these defenses and I'm looking at a document where somebody who's tested the product says, wow, these don't work. And we're telling the government they do work. And your argument is you didn't really say you wanted it to work. That's not going to gain any traction with the government. Right. Um, or you're arguing that, you know, the other people have settled so you don't have to pay any money. There are arguments you make that are not you personally, Jonathan, because I know you would never do this. But there are defense lawyers who come in and after they leave, I have to just pound my head on the table for a while till it stops hurting. Well, I can say, I can say that cooperation works, um, you know, because I've seen it work. And I mentioned earlier that, that Jay Fang versus 40 matter. And, and that's when I told you where the U.S. attorney, um, former U.S. attorney, tried to sell our complaint to the defendant so the defendant could get sort of a heads up on defending um, our uh, False Claims Act matter. And uh, the uh, general counsel for Fortinet was approached uh, and he immediately called the Justice Department and said, hey, this guy came in and um, he was trying to sell us a copy of this complaint. And so they actually, it was just like TV, they set up a sting operation. And I think they uh, met him in the lobby of a Hilton Garden Hotel and he had uh, a wig on and a baseball cap and he was about to make an exchange with the uh, complaint for money and the FBI, FBI agents jumped out and uh, I, I heard that he said, my life is over. But um, anyway, so the, the company did the right thing when they were approached with wrong conduct and they also did the right thing about the Chinese products. In that particular case, they were running products through a plant in um, Vancouver, Canada, actually changing the labels 
and putting made in Canada on them without even changing the serial number. So we knew exactly what product was. Well, they sat down and started working with the government about that. And I think they came out with a real good deal. Um, the government does give companies credit for early and uh, serious cooperation when something goes wrong. It's important. So, uh, uh, Alicia, to your, to your point, I don't, I don't disagree with your point where, where, where we have a situation and, and we see that, yeah, there was a problem, like where we agree with it because of our investigation. Well, we'll come right in and do exactly what you said. I mean, I, and the ones you and Vincent are talking about, I don't, I don't think anyone, I don't think anyone really disagrees with that. I've never met a defense counsel who was faced with an obvious violation who didn't want to go in as fast as you can to cooperate. I'm sure there are some out there maybe, but I've never seen it. Like uh, when we when we see we have a big problem, we want to get in right away to cooperate. But but by saying by saying the, the rule is to cooperate, I, my point is that doesn't mean the rule is to roll over just because you're being bullied. Like I, that that's just that's my distinction. My distinction is Sometimes the answer is, yeah, I'm cooperating, but you're wrong. I am currently in settlement negotiations with a defendant where they came in and early on they have their arguments, but they made a, a, a compelling showing on certain certain items that we were just wrong, that the information we were looking at was simply wrong. We spent some time with people, experts, and figured out that, by golly, they were right. The defendant was right. And so when we did our recent settlement presentation to them, they, we didn't even address those issues in the presentation. We didn't say they were right because, you know, I'm not <laughs> that, would do that. <laughs> that would be wrong. That would be wrong. Of well, course. I mean, silence speaks volume. And right. the truth is, based on what we know now, we probably would not pursue them for a portion of these. But for the remainder of it, you know, and and in a, sometimes we have situations where the damages just don't seem to fit what happened. And so we kind of threw it out there and said, look, we bought 35,000 of your widgets. They had this, this problem in them. We need to come up with a reasonable way to resolve this. And I'm not telling you what it is because as I sit here right now, you know, any of our standard practices would result in a huge windfall. And so we we anticipate getting together, you know, in the next couple months, virtually, of course, and talking it out. Um, but part of what happened there was that their lawyers were always reasonable. Um, you know, they had their arguments. They were very well prepared. And that's another one of my pet peeves is, you know, we've worked, you know, day and night and some, excuse my French, senior partner rolls in. And the only thing he's read is a memo written by a first year associate and he doesn't know what's going on. Um, and that it doesn't you know, make you think, wow, they're well represented here. Yeah, I agree with that. Uh, well, I think we can all agree on that one. So <laughs> <laughs> Couldn't agree uh, but you're laughing because you've seen it uh, <laughs> at, at other firms. We've seen at it. other oh. firms. Exactly. <laughs> no. Um, let me, uh, let me, if I could, change the subject from GSA schedules, which I know this panel in particular could talk about um, probably through the weekend, uh, and move on to uh, Department of Defense cases. Um, and uh, let me ask uh, Courtney if you, or if you could move the slides to keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Uh, stop. Um, so there are obviously countless creative ways that um, uh, defense contractors uh, attempt to overcharge the government. Um, uh, Alicia, though, how about if you could just lay out, I, I, we have this slide up of some of the four leading ones. If you could just discuss uh, briefly you know, what the common fact patterns are that your office uh, often sees. Yeah, I, um, I'm, so first of all, in the Truth and Negotiation Act uh, cases, it's often a situation where um, 
they've inflated the price by charging us things they're not supposed to, certain types of overhead, overcharging for things without disclosing it. Um, those cases largely relate to situations where auditors are going through the stuff, you know, line by line. And I will say, I avoid them like the plague. Um, <laughs> there are people in my office who do them and God bless them. Um, defective quality is a lot more interesting because it's often stuff that goes boom or isn't supposed to go boom. And you get to spend a lot of time figuring out how something works. And there is, there is a, a feeling, you know, because a lot of times it's flight critical parts or, you know, protective apparel where you know that if it really is defective, you've got to do something about it. Um, counterfeit parts, it's the same thing. Well, you were talking about um, commercial goods that come from China in connection with the GSA. There is a real problem that we deal with in military equipment, which is, you know, the ball bearings that came from China that are made out of the wrong kind of metal or aren't plated the right way um, that can fail in things. And that is one of our biggest fear that a ball bearing fails in a $40 million aircraft and we're looking at helicopter parts everywhere. So that's, that's important. Bid rigging, you know, that there is, um, I, my understanding is that there's an antitrust task force on it. Um, but I've not been involved with that. That's a vicious, um, a vicious rumor. <laughs> <laughs> but there have been some big, uh, bid rigging settlements, um, involving, um, uh, it fraudulently increasing the price of gasoline that was sold to um, our bases in, in Korea and I think Japan. Um, and those are some significant recoveries. Um, I do a good number of these cases and, and uh, I, I think it's interesting to note some of the differences and I'll be interested in what Jonathan's experience is with this. But um, uh, the differences between GSA schedule cases, other types of false claims act cases, healthcare cases, in contrast to these DOD cases. Um, and there are a couple things that, that sort of uh, jump to mind as, as, as differences. Um, one is that uh, the stakes, well, one is that there's a close relationship between the customer uh, frequently that is um, you, you, you just don't see in other areas that the customer, the, the DOD unit and the government contractor are working side by side, hand in hand. Um, and, and that that's, that's not always that, you know, it's not like the healthcare, the drug company is working with CMS on a regular basis or the hospital is working on with CMS on a regular basis. But here you frequently have a, a very close relationship. Um, there's a dependence on the customer. This is frequently for a lot of government contractors. It's the only type of work they do. And frequently they'll have only a handful of contracts. Um, and, and so there's a, a dependent relationship that doesn't necessarily exist. If somebody is selling, you know, desks or waste paper baskets and that they they happen to be on the GSA schedule as well as commercial sales. Um, the nature, the heavily regulated uh, nature of the environment that everything is, you know, you're dealing with the military. There's a FAR regulation for everything. There's a contract provision for everything. You're in a very uh, 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 complicated regulatory environment and frequently uh, one that while there's a regulation for everything, how that regulation is interpreted and what it means in certain contexts is, is very unclear. Um, and uh, I guess the fourth one is that there are the stakes frequently in the government contracting, government contracting area. Um, you know, if you're just talking about overcharging or, you know, selling your desk on the GSA, um, it's very different in the DOD context if you are dealing with uh, sailors and, you know, the helicopter or the, uh, as Alicia spent a lot of time with uh, bulletproof vests that the government people are wearing, uh, there's really uh, people's lives are at stake and uh, uh, there, it's just a different 
uh, set of issues you have that uh, that arise there. I mean, for example, um, if you get a CID in an ordinary case, it's going to be about you know whether it's a TINA violation or not. You, you uh, just, uh, just talk about negotiating the CID and collecting the documents. If it's about whether there's a counterfeit part on a uh, helicopter and you're that helicopter manufacturer, you want to call up the, the AUSA and say, I, I don't care about the CID. What I care about is there are people on my helicopters flying around. Uh, and how are we going to get to the bottom as fast as possible uh, about the safety of the helicopters? The, the, the amount of money that I, the defense contractor, owe you uh, is, uh, is way down on the list of issues. Uh, the issues we're concerned about are the safety of our product and the, the safety of the people who are using our product. Um, so, uh, you know, those are uh, some important differences, and they, they – again, shape the way you respond to things. Um, uh, you know, the, f to give another example, the um, fact that your, your client is dependent on the government for almost all its business means that you cannot, as a government contractor, you can't engage in sort of scorched earth uh, defense tactics um, because these guys are your customer. And if, you antagonize them through the course of the litigation to such an extent that they don't want to do business with you anymore, you've lost all your business. And you can't just find another, you know, Department of Defense somewhere. Uh, th th there's no commercial market for your, um, you know, uh, weapon of mass destruction. Um, so uh, from... A government contractor standpoint, you are frequently, when you're in the DOD area and you are totally dependent on having DOD business, suspension and debarment is always out there. It's always in the back of your mind, and it uh, is something that you need to be thinking about how you're going to handle from the first time you get that CID through the settlement negotiations. So, so there, there are some other things here, too, because I've had some DOD cases. Think about the fact, excuse my dogs in the back, but think about some of these uh, products are specially designed, and they have only one purpose, and that is to, say, protect the soldiers uh, from, you know, from explosions in the road and things like that, a vehicle to try, carry the troops. And they only have one particular use. And, and so there are a lot of unique issues that come up when you look at a parts list of things that were made just for this particular vehicle. Uh, what's the commercial price for that? And so, you know, what's your comparator and how is the price being established? So it creates a lot of situations where they can bury profit. And so your overall profit is supposed to be 6%, but you can, like, add a little things, smidgens here and there. So it is an accounting uh, a expert case, and you have to dig into it and find out. Oh, wait a second! Uh, these these bearings, uh, the closest thing to these bearings in the commercial world is X, and these things only cost, you know, a, a few dollars over here, and there's no real difference. They're being made on the same machines, you know. So it, it gets into that level of line item detail. So it does present, you know, its own set of circumstances. Can I, I want to add two more to your list, Michael. Great. Uh, in terms of some of these differences. Uh, another one is a very practical matter. The way the investigation gets conducted by the government is quite different. It, on, the, on the GSA schedule side, it's typically the GSA IG, and that's it. Very limited resources. They don't have tons of agencies at their disposal. It's, it's one or two IG agents and maybe an auditor. Um, but on the DOD side, as you're talking about, it's, it's an entire audit arm. It's all of DCAA. And then it's the Defense Criminal Investigation Service. And then each agency wants to have their special agents involved. So it's a whole broader cast of characters and resources they're able to bring to bear. And, and then the second difference I see is, is often, I, I see something in the Department of Defense space that I don't see as much in the commercial item space. And that's this. There's a lot of situations where 
the contractors working hand in hand with the government. They're, they're in the field together. They're in the trenches together. And, and the government asks them to do something and they do it because it's necessary for the effort. And then an auditor, com an auditor comes in, you know, a year later and says, where's your receipt for that? Um, we saw that in the Persian Gulf War, for example. And, and I think, I think it is, it is useful to remember that, that you got these very patriotic companies that will do whatever, whatever their, government colleague wants them to do, but they sometimes can forget that, oh, there's a contracting officer that's going to want this form filled out. And that that's a problem you don't often see in the commercial item side that you do see in the government contract side. Um, can I respond? Absolutely. I was hoping you would. <laughs> but I'm not responding to you. I'm responding to Michael. Um, All right. So uh, when I started at the department in 1998, I would not say that there was a lot of cooperation. There was a lot of scorched earth litigation involving the biggest defense contractors um, for parts that they knew were defective at the time they went out the door. Um, I know I spent years of my life on one and it was ugly, it was nasty, it was meaner than any I'd seen at Gibson Dunn. And let me tell you, we prided ourselves of playing hardball and there has been a sea change. And I think that a lot of people in the defense industry have realized the things that Michael was going through, you know, listing out there that this is our client. But more importantly, I have recently just I had to reach out to various major defense contractors and say, we think there's a component in your whatever that may not work. And we're not sure what you used it in, but it went to your missile manufacturing company. Can you kind of check for us? And within 20 minutes, they had a team of people on the phone going through because they don't want one of those to blow up, you know, and I really found that was heartening because there is a point where it's not just about litigation and recoveries. I mean, can you imagine if you knew about this and you just decided you were going to pursue the normal course and um, something horrible happened? It's not just that you're sitting in front of the Senate. It's that you, you know, you don't want to be the person who didn't ring the bell. Uh, at least twice in my career, I've had people call me up, whistleblowers who were aware of some major safety defect associated with a, a piece of defense equipment. And they, they said, well, Mr. McKnight, um, I don't really want to be a whistleblower, but I want the government to know about this. And so I would interview them about the nature of the problem. And then I call somebody over the Justice Department and say, look, I've got some information about this. Who should I talk to? This is true. The phone would ring within about 15 minutes. <laughs> and it would be somebody from XYZ division going, tell me what you got. And then I would tell them and I'd say, well, they, they, they would ask me the source. And I'd say, he doesn't want to be known. He just wants you to know there's a problem with that particular defense system. And you ought to look into it um, so the lives aren't lost. And so, you know, it's interesting. We all work against each other. Sometimes we work with each other. Sometimes we work with each other today against each other tomorrow. But at, at, at the end of the day, sometimes, you know, uh, the most important thing is to uh, do the right thing. Let me add one other thing that's different um, uh, in the defense industry, uh, which is there is a, a mandatory uh, disclosure rule uh, if you're aware of credible evidence of uh, violations of the False Claims Act or uh, fraud. Um, so it, it's, I, I, I do think the defense industry has uh, re recognized that it, um, you know, it, it needs to handle these things in a mature way and it needs to uh, uh, have strong compliance systems, et cetera. Um, but I, I also think that the defense industry has to, has recognized that it has a uh, obligation under the FAR to investigate and disclose things, and I think that has uh, you know has has quite frankly had a positive impact. Um, you, you know what's what what's interesting about that? I, so I, I was on the I was on the ABA task force that wrote the guide to the mandatory disclosure rule, and I know some of the people on this. Uh, on the guest list here at War as well. I see some names I recognize from that task force. It, it was it was very interesting. Because, so DOJ pushed that forward 
as part of their, my favorite named act ever, the Close the Contractor Fraud Loophole Act. And, <laughs> and, and everyone thought it was going to be just, just an unbelievable sea change in disclosures. What, what, I, what always struck me about that was, was most of us in industry, and Michael, I know I can speak for you because you and I grew up together at this, but, but we would always self-disclose if we saw a big problem, a serious problem. And, and I think now that we've had mandatory disclosure on the books for a long time, you know what, GSA's, GSA's numbers went up in terms of self-disclosures. DOD's went up a little bit, <laughs> hasn't touched a single agency other than that, even though it applies to civilian and, domestic and defense contracting equally. It's been very interesting to watch. That is interesting. Um, um, I see that we only have a few minutes left, and I, I did want to talk briefly about what people see as being the potential areas for uh, future uh, uh, developing uh, False Claims Act cases. Um, uh, Jonathan, could you talk a little bit about, a little bit about Section 889? <laughs> sure. sure. So Section 889 is fascinating. So some of you might know it as the, uh, well, some people call it the Anti-Huawei Act, but it's the, it's the rule that says you can't sell to the government uh, products that contain technology from Huawei or four other companies. And, and the rule is interesting because it's, it's, it's poorly written, it's vague, it's very complicated, but more importantly, it is massively extensive. And, and if you're a contractor, it not only covers what you're selling to the government, it covers your use of this technology, even unrelated to a government contract. And, and that part is just so expansive. But when I think about 889, and I think back, and Vincent will remember this, when I think back to like the first TAA cases, Safina Office Products, right, in 20, 2005, I, if I had a guess where I'm going to see plaintiff's attorneys turn their attention next, I, I think it would be 889 because it's very similar to the TAA model back in 2005. I hope I'm wrong, uh, but, but that, that's my guess. And Vincent, I'm curious what you think about it. I know you were involved in a lot of the early TAA cases. Well, yes, I, I had the Safina case, so I'm, I am, I'm aware of it. But I think that I have a different view on this. I think that as I, as I look over the, the regulations and their, um, I'm impressed with their lack of clarity. So I see, <laughs> I see, I see defenses and red flags. Yeah, um, no, that's fair. I, 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 I see, I didn't know any better. This was unclear. I see materiality issues. I see the government uh, I, I having a lack of desire to enforce this under the FCA. They may enforce through certain administrative mechanisms and things like that. But early on, especially since this just went into effect in, I know, what, 2019, and, and there's a new one just went into effect, part of it went into effect August of 2020, I don't really see any traction here till maybe five years from now and the dust settles and everybody knows what we're doing with it. I don't see anything right away. That's how I look at it. Well, and I, I just, I don't see DOJ getting involved. I agree with that. I, if I were DOJ, I wouldn't want to waste my time at something with so many defenses just screaming out at you. But I, I'm, I'm still, I'm still thinking we're going to see some relators cases. But it sounds well, like you're going to be one of them. So I couldn't be happier. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, the, the problem here is that um, from our side, in investigating uh, an FCA case takes a lot of time and attention and sweat equity. And so, you know, you have to be judicious yeah, with your time and your resources. And, you know, so if you think that um, it's a situation that DOJ is not going to be interested in at the end of the day and then you have to go it alone, think how many hours you've spent, you know, chasing and tilting at windmills. Yep. And there, there's, there's plenty of fraud out here. That's easier. No, <laughs> I'm sorry, there is. There's lots of fraud out here, so there's plenty to do without uh, being, you know, uh, you know, chasing this one down. So uh, maybe it's because I have a little more gray hair or no hair at all. But I would, uh, I would probably stand on the sidelines and watch this one develop for a while while I, uh, you know, till other fields. Well, talk, talking about tilling other fields. Um, uh, uh, the coronavirus. 
Um, uh, is that going to be a source of procurement uh, fraud cases? I think that's a very interesting question. I think that um, you've got a lot of things going on now. I mean, um, you've got a, a national emergency, right? You've got, uh, and everybody knows about it. And then you've got, you know, trillions of dollars being poured into the field. And so, okay, everybody's heard of Lamborghini Man, you know, somebody who, uh, th I don't know why this is. Every other day you see somebody buying a Lamborghini with the pay, uh, Paycheck Protection Act dollars and things like that. And I don't know why Lamborghinis are, so, uh, are the favorite car for fraudsters. But anyway, you read about it about every other week. Well, am I going to sue Lamborghini Man? You know, uh, no, that's a waste of my time. I mean, you know, I, I'm not going to do that. Uh, if if you were to find, say, a, a bank that's uh, that somehow systematically uh, gave out money improperly without doing checking off all the boxes for uh, whether the people were appropriate to it, that might be a defendant. I see more of a possibility here, actually, in the procurement area where you're talking about um, defective PPE or, uh, you know, selling all of the things associated with the, uh, you know, with um, this massive effort in order to, to beat back the virus. I think there's, I think there's a potential there more than anything else is in the defective and fraudulent PPE. And, and, and we've seen some of that from the, um, uh, you know, from the customs and security enforcements that have gone on, on out there for people bringing in counterfeit products that don't, uh, you know, meet our, our guidelines. So there may be some cases that come out of that. But also, you have to worry about, um, you know, whether the contractor who sold it actually was aware of the fact that he was getting counterfeit products. That's an important issue. And, and is the DOJ going to have the appetite to enforce against um, one of its partners, say uh, some of the stuff's being sold on the GSA, who uh, made every effort to determine that um, the face masks that he was buying were good, only to find out that they weren't. And I'm not so sure that's going to happen in this environment. So again, I'm uh, I'm going to watch and see how things unfold. And you got to wait for the right. I'm sure there's fraud that's going to pop out eventually, but it's not going to be a fraud gold mine because of the emergency that we are faced with right now. That's just my view. Alicia, you have anything to add to that? Um, I think it's too early to tell. Um, certainly I feel long, and this is a person, I, I like all my opinions. This is my personal opinion. I do not speak on behalf of the Department of Justice, like the way I worked that in there finally. <laughs> um, Lamborghini man should be fully investigated and all appropriate responses taken to him. Um, I think there is a potential for people who are getting large amounts of money who made false statements for there to be recoveries. You know, companies that falsified what they were, you know, that they really didn't qualify for money and they took it anyhow. And there's going to be cases like that. Whether they come out as False Claims Act cases or criminal cases, I don't know. Um, it's really too early to tell. And it's not something we've even, you know, that I'm aware of any any gearing up on. Um, now, that doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just nobody's dragged me into it. Uh, Jonathan, you want the last word? <laughs> No, I don't. I want you to have the last word. No, no. I, I, I think I think what's interesting here is, is you know, the the overarching things we're all saying. We we actually don't disagree that that much, right? We all we all agree where you where you on the defense side see something that's wrong. We we generally turn ourselves in, and we and we always cooperate. Um, we just you know have have different. I can't say everybody. Michael and my firms always cooperate. Um, and you know, and and I I think on the healthcare side, we are going to see um, we are going to see some uh, false claims as cases come out of that. Michael wouldn't surprise me at all. Yeah, uh, I was always told, uh, probably by Jack Basey, to follow the money. And uh, there's a lot of money being spent on uh, uh, PPE and virus uh, vaccines and the like. And uh, 
that tends to attract uh, some bad elements, and uh, that usually leads to false claims act cases. And while I agree with Jonathan that we will cooperate when uh, our my clients will cooperate um, uh, and assist the investigation, we'll also uh, fight like hell if we think the government is uh, off base. Which um, they usually are. <laughs> um, we've already run over. Um, so Stop yourself. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, Alicia, wanna... you can't let him get away with that last one. That can't be the last one. You know he's lying. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I knew this would degenerate. Um, thanks. That's all the time we have today. Again, uh, thanks. I want to thank my panel for um, their, their insights uh, and everyone else who uh, attended. Um, I want to thank you for joining us. And on behalf of the ABA and the ABA Criminal Justice Section, uh, I'm Michael Waldman, and thank you all for joining us. Um, and let me urge you, there's a, uh, a 2.30 session on loan and grant fraud. Um, and uh, I was told to encourage you to uh, browse the virtual lobby for any open networking sessions. So again, thank you to my panelists. Thank you for uh, attending my, the, the audience, and goodbye. <laughs>